We're continuing our study of Genesis today, and we find ourselves in chapter 23. And I'm sure we're all aware of the saying, there are two certainties in life, right? Death and taxes. Well, I'm not preaching about taxes this morning, but we are going to talk about death. Death is one of those things our culture likes to ho-hum around, right? And try to avoid thinking about and discussing, if at all possible. It's also been something humans have been trying to figure out how to avoid. But we haven't been successful yet, have we? Nor will we be. It doesn't matter how many safety features we add to our cars, how many precautions we take with our children, how clean we eat, what kind of drugs we develop, what kind of tech we create, or how many surgeries we have, death is coming. We're not going to escape it with exercise, with diet, technology, or science. The question is whether we're prepared for it or not. Of course, I spend a lot of my ministry trying to make sure people are prepared for their own deaths. That's why you proclaim the gospel. But not as much gets spent on preparing you for the death of others which is what I want, intend to do today. My focus is not going to be on estate planning, you know, how to make a will or set up a trust fund or whether to bury or to cremate or what to do when you can't find your loved one's passwords or the silver they buried in the backyard after they're gone. Rather, I want you to be prepared for how to respond to death spiritually and relationally. And I believe that this story that we find about Abraham this morning gives us two things that we should not forget when death comes. And there's one more that I'm going to add to that to finish the thought, the theme that I'm going to bring in from other scriptures. But first, we're, I'm going to read through this whole chapter. It's not a very long chapter. Now, Sarah lived 127 years. These were all the years of her life. Sarah died in Kareath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan, and Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. When Abraham got up from beside his dead wife, he spoke to the Hittites. I'm an alien residing among you. Give me burial property among you so that I can bury my dead. The Hittites replied to Abraham, listen to us, my Lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in our finest burial place. None of us will withhold from you his burial place for burying your dead. Then Abraham rose and bowed down to the Hittites, the people of the land. He said to them, if you are willing for me to bury my dead, listen to me and ask Ephron, son of Zohar, on my behalf to give me the cave at Machpelah that belongs to him. It is at the end of his field. Let him give it to me in your presence for the full price as burial property. Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, so in the hearing of all the Hittites who came to the gate of his city, Ephron the Hittite said, answered Abraham, No, my lord, listen to me. I give you the field, and I give, it, and I give you the cave that is in it. I give it to you in the sight of my people. Bury your dead. Abraham bowed down to the people of the land and said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, Listen to me, if you please. Let me pay the price of the field. Accept it from me and let me bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham and said to him, My lord, listen to me, land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. And Abraham agreed with Ephron, and Abraham weighed out to Ephron the silver that he had agreed to in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 standard shekels of silver. So Ephron's field at Machpelah near Mamre, the field with its cave and all the trees anywhere within the boundaries of the field, became Abraham's possession in the sight of all the Hittites who came to the gates of his city. After this, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave of the field at Machpelah near Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field with this cave passed from the Hittites to Abraham as burial property. Let's pray. God, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Thank you for... Thank you for this passage of scripture and all the other helpful and comforting things that we're going to learn from scripture today. Lord, we, we've, 
all had some kind of experiences with death, and we know that more are coming. And it's important to be prepared. And this is the kind of message that will hit each person a little differently depending on their own past experiences, present experiences. But no matter what we're going through, no matter what we've been through, let us see the glory of the Lord this morning. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. I hope you guys are awake. Don't let the, uh, the nice little calming rain sounds lull you to sleep this morning. Or my muted gray colors. <clears throat> I figured I would dress kind of similar to a, I might at a funeral or something this morning. But we're gonna, I'm going to be focusing mainly on the first four verses of this chapter. And we're going to go back and start with verse 1 and 2. Now Sarah lived 127 years. These were all the years of her life. Sarah died in Kareth Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Abraham and Sarah. Goodness. I mean, think about this. These two were married for like over 100 years. They had been through the gamut together. She was there as his partner through all the ups and downs, and they had ups and downs. We've studied many of them, and you know that there was more that haven't been recorded for us. But even the things that we've studied, we think about the excitement and the adventure when God called Abraham away from his home, away from the land of Ur, to go to an unknown land. And so they would travel to Canaan, and then there was a time when they actually went to Egypt for a little bit, and then they came back to Canaan. And they were sojourners together, Foreigners in a strange land that God had promised to give to their descendants, but a promise that neither of them would live to see fulfilled. She worried about Abraham as he went off to fight a coalition of kings to get back his nephew Lot. She was there with him through the time when he met Melchizedek. She witnessed her husband's circumcision and a change of his name. So, so, she had to get used to calling him Abraham instead of Abram, and he had to get used to calling her Sarah instead of Sarai after so many decades of marriage together. I'm sure that wasn't easy. Sarah saw Abraham intercede for Lot again when the city of Sodom was destroyed. They suffered together as Sarah couldn't have kids for most of their marriage, and they rejoiced together when she finally did, when she was over 90 years old. Let's not forget, as we studied last week, Sarah had to sit and wait while her husband and her only child went off on a journey to Mount Moriah. They had good times together and they had struggles. Sarah kept pawning, or Abraham kept pawning Sarah off as his sister, which we know, yes, is one of the most common sources of marital strife. <laughs> not really. But she would get involved with these kings and relationships that she never wanted. And they created their own family drama by having Abraham conceive a child with Hagar. This old married couple truly exhibits what many mean in their wedding vows today. For better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health. Till death do us part. I don't know if Abraham and Sarah had any kind of wedding vows, but what they had was a lifelong commitment to one another. No matter what sins they committed or what situations they encountered. And that's a lot more than I can say about a lot of marriages today. Right? The old, the old adage, till death do us part, was not common tradition in their time. They lived it out better than most now. They lived it out the way that it's meant to be lived out as a reflection of God's love for his people. You see, in the book of Hosea, God tells the prophet Hosea to go marry a prostitute. And God wanted him to do this as an illustration of his own relationship to the people of Israel. You see, God often used the lives of his, these poor prophets. He used their lives as these graphic illustrations of what it is like to be the God of a stubborn and unfaithful people. And so Hosea did. He went and he married this prostitute. And what would happen is he would, she would be with him for a little bit and then she would run back off into her old life. And God said, well, you got to go get her. 
You're going to have to go find her and buy her back. And so, so Hosea would, and he was in this cycle of being with her, and then she would run off, and he would have to go find her and buy her back and redeem her. And that was an illustration of the way that God, that cycle that he was in with his wife was the same cycle that God was in with his people and how unfaithful they continued to be, but he would continue to love them and find them and redeem them. And everything I know from Scripture about marriage leads me to tell couples that they should give up on each other when Christ gives up on them. It is sad to see the institution of marriage slowly deteriorate into what it has become today. Most ceremonies should really change the end of their vows to something like, till irreconcilable differences do us part. Or till we just don't want to be together anymore. And I know that comes off kind of as like a half joke, but I'm serious, right? Like, say what we mean. Why say till death do us part if that's not what we mean? Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. But that's even assuming that a couple values the idea of commitment enough to get married in the first place. Love, though, is what carried Abraham and Sarah through both of their roller coasters of faith. It was their love and their faith in the Lord, but eventually death did do them part. And Abraham did what you would expect a loving husband to do. He grieved. That seems simple enough, but I think you might be surprised at how many people forget to do that. See, when death comes, do not forget to grieve. People do. They forget or they refuse. It can be a bit of both, right? You might be sitting here this morning having endured dozens of funerals in your lifetime, or you may be here having barely ever dealt with death. Either way, death is coming. And when that happens, we need to be prepared to walk through it. People have used all kinds of coping mechanisms to deal with death, right? Some turn to alcohol and drugs to numb the pain. Some try to go on about their life as usual, hoping to push the feelings aside and that they'll just maybe just go away at some point. Others fall into a pit of despair so deep that they they struggle to ever climb back out of it. But Abraham didn't fall into any of those traps. He started by simply grieving. He let himself mourn the death of his wife. And many things can delay or block our mourning our loved ones, right? I mean, this is hard to think about. It's crazy to think about. But when someone dies, it's possible for the first thing on, on people's minds to be to the logistical nightmare that it creates. I mean, how often can families get caught up in all, all the planning and the paperwork and the phone calls and the other headaches that come along with death instead of just sitting and crying, and praying. Others might immediately turn to the inheritance nightmare that has gotten so much worse as time goes on and we fall further and further from the Lord. Nowadays, anytime there's a death with an inheritance involved, I pretty much have come to expect that there's going to be drama, that there's going to be family fighting, and likely even lawsuits. It seems to be the exception now when those things don't happen. The pandemic produced an additional barrier to grief, right? People were having to say goodbye to their loved ones over Zoom and phone calls. And more and more are foregoing having funerals altogether. And so less, fewer and fewer families are actually taking that time to come together and create that space for grief. And what comes along with that is there's fewer and fewer opportunities for ministers of the true gospel to present the hope of Christ to those families. So I want to give a word of pastorly advice. When death comes, facilitate the grieving process. Right? Take the beginning to just mourn and create space for others to mourn. Don't rush into all the logistics. The first thing you need to do is grieve, not start making a list of things that need to get done. And when you do start making plans, please plan a service. Create that space and that time for a family to come together and share that sorrow and give a minister of the gospel the chance to proclaim the gospel. It's a wonderful opportunity. So Abraham, he took time to grieve 
first. That's what he did. And then he moved on to the necessary arrangements. When Abraham got up from beside his dead wife, he spoke to the Hittites. I'm an alien residing among you. Give me burial property among you so that I can bury my dead. So at this point in time, we we know that Abraham, he was still just a stranger in this land. This isn't where he was from. He didn't own any land here yet. And so you might be wondering, well, why even bury her there? Why not take her back to where you guys were from? Go back to Ur, bury her there. But this is where we can see the, the light of Abraham's faith shining through the darkness of his wife's death, right? Because this was the land God had promised to their descendants. And so he was planning ahead based on his faith. He believed in what God had said. He believed in God's promises. And when death comes, do not forget to believe. Abraham looked forward and developed a place that would actually end up housing his family's bones for generations to come. But that could only happen if God came through. Kent Hughes put it this way. He said, Abraham was so sure that his descendants would get the land that he wanted Sarah's bones to be there when they got there. By owning a part of the land, he was prophesying its ultimate ownership. And he went on to point out how this piece of property would become an enduring testament to Abraham's faith. I thought this was... Just really cool how he went through what happened with this piece of property in Hebron, in the land of Canaan, and Abraham's family. See, Machpelah in Hebron became a monument to Abraham's faith and God's sure word of promise. By faith, Abraham believed God's promise that his descendants would inherit the land. By faith, Abraham sojourned in the land for almost a century, living as one to whom it would belong. By faith, Abraham purchased the cave at Machpelah in Hebron. By faith, Abraham buried Sarah in the cave at Hebron. By faith, Isaac buried Abraham with Sarah at Hebron. By faith, Jacob buried his father Isaac at Hebron. By faith, while in Egypt, Jacob charged his sons to bury him in Hebron. By faith, Jacob's sons had him embalmed and took his remains to Hebron for burial. By faith, as the very last lines of Genesis record, then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from there. So Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Well, by faith, Moses, 430 years later at the Exodus, took Joseph's bones up out of Egypt, and then for 40 years bore his mummified remains throughout Israel's wanderings. By faith, when Joshua conquered the promised land, he buried Joseph's body in fulfillment of the same principle in a plot of land earlier purchased by Joseph's father, Jacob. Isn't that amazing? The faith of Abraham, his belief would carry on for generations through his family. See, when death comes and we find ourselves in the midst of heartache, We have to remember that we don't grieve like the rest of the world. 1 Thessalonians says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. That means dead. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. See, the only funerals I've done so far are for people that I did not know. And one of the things that I've done in those opportunities is point out the significance of those families reaching out to someone like me. Jared Wilson said, you can ignore religion your whole life, but never, never at death. And so why, when someone dies who wasn't a part of a church, do they call someone like me, a, a minister at a church? Why not go to the university and grab yourself a professor? Why not go to the mall and get a successful businessman? Well, I think in part it's because nobody wants to show up at a funeral and hear, here lies Matt, whose life was meaningless and who is now nowhere. You see, the university teaches a lot of things, but not answers about death and meaning. You can get a lot of stuff at the mall, but not hope for eternal life. That's where we come in. See, the world doesn't have those answers. Otherwise, they wouldn't be coming to us, to strangers, to help them when they're trying to grieve. We should not forget to grieve, but we should not grieve the way the rest of the world grieves. Especially, I mean, in any case, but even especially when we're talking about someone whose life gives us all indications that they were a true repentant believer and that they are with their Lord in heaven. Those funerals are different. 
Because when we gather to remember those lives, it's not just to grieve, but it is to celebrate because we have hope. The very next verse says, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. John 11, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Hebrews 11, this is the hall of faith chapter. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited. What did he wait for? He waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. You skip to verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly if they had called to mind the country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now, they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And guess what? What he was looking forward to, what they were looking forward to, that they never got to see fulfilled, it's not just for Abraham, it's not just for his physical family, it's for every true believer in the gospel. Galatians 3 says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. And Philippians 3 says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Death comes. Emory, stop. Whether we like it or not. When it does, we grieve. And we believe. We grieve what has been lost in this world, but we believe what is found in the gospel. But there's one more step I want to remind us to take. When death comes, don't forget to receive. What I mean by that is receiving the comfort of God and of others. And for this one, I have to step outside of this particular passage, but it connects to this theme and it finishes these thoughts. I know there's a difference between grieving the death of a believer and an unbeliever. And there are many different kinds of loss that we go through in life. But no matter what kind of loss it is, we can't forget that we have a God who understands and who cares for us. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. See, when death comes, it is not meant to be something that we tackle alone. When we are grieving, we can go two different directions, right? We can harden our heart against God and reject his comfort, or we can open our heart to him and receive his comfort. And we can do the same thing with our brothers and sisters in Christ as well. But I would implore you, don't put those walls up. Don't shut out God and others. Let them come and, and share with that grief. Because if we don't, then it will only add to our grief. A joy shared is doubled. A sorrow shared is halved. Death comes. Don't forget it. When it does, don't forget to grieve. It's the simplest idea, but it can be the most difficult. So don't rush past that part. And in the midst of that grief, don't forget to believe. Believe the promises that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do not mourn as those who have no hope. But finally, don't forget to receive. Let God and others share that burden with you. See, as a pastor, it's easy to spend a lot of time preparing a church for 
trials and tribulations and persecutions. But we also need to be prepared for death. Of course, I want us to be prepared for our own death. And the only way to do that is to believe in who Jesus is, the, who, what the Bible teaches, who Jesus said he was. You have to believe in him, but not just believe, not just acknowledge it, but you have to repent. You have to turn away from your sins and choose to put your faith in him. And by putting faith, it doesn't just mean saying a prayer. It doesn't just mean getting baptized. It means choosing to make him the Lord of your life and follow him. That's the only way that you can be prepared for your own death. But I also want to make sure that we're prepared for the death of others. And I believe that Abraham would agree with something that Job said, which we'll see in a second. You see, Job, he was this guy in the Bible that suffered immensely more than Abraham ever did. But I thought it was so cool to see these same three steps in Job's life. And I want to show that to you. So let's take a brief look at what happened to Job to begin with. <laughs> this is the most brutal section of Scripture. Job chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Now on the day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the female donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabians attacked and took them. They also killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The Chaldeans formed three units and made a raid on the camels and took them and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Death came to Job's life. But what did he do? Well, the very next question, Next verse, then Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. He grieved. And then what did he do? He fell to the ground and worshiped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. This is what I think Abraham would agree with right here. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away Blessed be the name of the Lord. But that third step, receiving, you know, we end up seeing that at the end of Job's story. We can jump from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 42. The Lord also restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord increased double all that Job had, then all his brothers, all his sisters, and all who had known him before came to him. And they ate bread with him in his house, and they sympathized with him and comforted him for all the adversities that the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him a piece of money and each a ring of gold. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. You see, Job received. He received comfort from the Lord and from others in his life that loved him. When death comes, don't forget to grieve. When death comes, don't forget to believe. When death comes, don't forget to receive. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But in all, blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you for this passage of scripture. Lord, I, people may look at a sermon like this and think, man, why did he choose to do that? And I didn't choose to do it, Lord. Your word gave us this information that, we need, that I had to share. Because we're not here to tickle one another's ears and, and say the things that we all want to hear. Lord, 
You give us what we need, not what we want. And I believe that these truths and that these three steps are very much needed. And I pray that we would take them to heart. Lord, no matter how much internet and, and movies and TV and video games or no matter radio, whatever, we try to fill our minds with all the time to try to keep ourselves from thinking about the hard things that we don't want to think about. The reality is death comes. And it would pain my heart to see the people under my influence and under my care not be ready to know how to navigate that. It would pain my heart to see anyone shut themselves off from the care of the Lord and from their brothers and sisters in Christ. It would pain my heart to see people lose their faith in the midst of that grief. So God, we ask for help. We ask for your guidance, for your wisdom. We ask for help us to know how best to comfort others. Help us to know how best to pray for others, to sympathize. And help us to be prepared, Lord. Because when death comes, it is a tragedy, but it is also an opportunity. The gospel can really get through in some people's lives. It can open up a door or a window that had been closed off before. So we pray for, the, for that to happen, Lord. And we, we want to lift up all those who are currently grieving all the families who have gone through death. Thank you for being the God of all comfort. Thank you for being a God who doesn't just look down on us and, and try to wonder how we feel, but came down to us and lived this life. And thank you for giving us the hope of the gospel that we do not grieve as those who have no hope, but we look forward to eternal life. Do we believe this? I pray that we do. And I pray that there's, if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know Christ, that is not prepared for their own death, that they would take care of that today. That they wouldn't wait another minute. And we ask all these things in Christ's holy name. Amen.